Is Oklahoma City destined to become a world-class metropolis? Sam Anderson will be here to talk about his debut book, Boomtown. How well does fiction handle the subject of finance? Andrew Ross Sarkin and David Enrich will be here to talk about Gary Steingart's Lake Success, Tom Wolfe's Bonfire of the Vanities, and more. Alexander Alter will give us an update from the publishing world. Plus, our critics Dwight Garner, Jen Salai, and Parl Sagel will talk about what's the latest in literary criticism. This is the Book Review Podcast from The New York Times. I'm Pamela Paul. Sam Anderson joins us now. He is a staff writer at The New York Times Magazine and the author of a new book, his first book, Boomtown, the Fantastical Saga of Oklahoma City, its chaotic founding, its apocalyptic weather, its purloined basketball team, and the dream of becoming a world-class metropolis. Sam, thanks for being here. I think we just took up the whole segment with you reading my subtitle. Have you memorized your own subtitle? No. I, I, I have been guilty of the same. I have here. to like look up my subtitle. No, it was like suspenseful for me to listen to you read it. It's you like, have to find out next? Right. Oh, right. what else is in this book. Yeah. So how did this book come to be? Is it is it a biography of a city? It is. That's a good way to describe it. It really started casually with a magazine assignment. I was standing in the editor-in-chief of the New York Times Magazine's office, and he said, we want you to write a big, colorful, splashy cover story. What can it be about? And we were just kind of shooting the breeze. And he said, well, you're a basketball fan. This team from Oklahoma City just made it to the NBA Finals. They're a weird team. They're brand new. They're stolen from Seattle. Why don't you go check that out and see what's going on? So I went on this assignment to write about the basketball team. The Thunder. The Oklahoma City Thunder. And I got immediately sucked into this larger story and found out that everything, including basketball, is just connected to everything else. All right. Well, what's the larger story? Like, how, And how did basketball get you to that? So the larger story is that I like to tell people that Oklahoma City is the most secretly interesting place in America. And I think in a way it is a perfect microcosm of America. It's a city with a wonderfully bizarre history. It started on a single day. This was land. It was known as the unassigned lands that had been cleared by the federal government. The indigenous tribes of the plains used to be there. And suddenly it was this unoccupied space in the middle of the Great Plains. Well, probably not so suddenly for the the, the, the previous inhabitants. Yeah, it was, it was this kind of horrific process of, you know, reneging on treaties and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And the white settlers around it were like, okay, federal government, you need to give us this land. And Mm -hmm. the federal government finally was convinced to do that. And they did it in pretty much the worst way possible, which was they said, anybody who wants any of this land, line up around the border, 300 mile long border. And at noon on this one day, April 22nd, 1889, Mm -hmm. we'll give a signal and everybody just run for it. And you claim whatever you can claim. But like, how do you do that? I mean, you can't physically like lie down on a on a plot of land. No, you're hammering stakes down to define the the corners of your plot, and you get a you know a huge area of land out in the country, and you get a smaller plot in the city, and so you had something like a hundred thousand people come from all around the world to do this. I mean, this is 1889. This yeah. is like that's an 18 in front of that, but that's 11 years before the 20th century. I mean, it's essentially yesterday. So, did anyone die? Yes. People fell off their horses. So so at noon, you get the signal, you get cannons and guns fired off, and you get people just racing into this territory, and it's really rough. And they're riding on wagons, and they're riding on mules, and, and people are just, and wagons are collapsing left and right, and people are flying out of them, and people are shooting to speed up their horses, and they're accidentally shooting other settlers. And I mean, the horses are dying of exhaustion. It's just total chaos. And when the dust kind of settles... That evening, 10,000 of those people have settled on the site of what becomes Oklahoma City. So the place goes from zero to 10,000 in a few hours on this one day. And so you get this kind of instant city. I call it in the book microwave popcorn. And it's not the way a city is supposed to form. There's nothing natural about it. And so after that, on day two, the sun comes up and everyone looks around and it's like, where are we and what is this place and how do we make it into a functional city? And they really had to kind of experience in fast forward the normal growing pains of a democracy, of finding a way to live with your neighbors and 
what land in that area is going to constitute streets because mm-hmm. it was all claimed by people. So. so the federal government is the one that sort of mandated this. Mm. And then did they just sort of pass it off to the state? There was no state. There was nothing. I mean, it was, I call it in the book pirate civics. It was just, there was no plan. Historians agree this was just the absolute worst way to start a city you possibly could. And mm-hmm. it went very badly. And they never did it again on this scale. The federal government said, we're going to manage this a little better in the future when it happens. The state doesn't come along until 1907. So it's a territory. And in fact, the settlers of Oklahoma. There was no musical. No. This, there was no no one singing. And the settlers, in fact, were so kind of chaotic and wrongheaded and in a lot of ways helpless. They had to be bailed out by the federal government so they didn't starve. The federal government finally stepped in and said, listen, you guys are making such a mess of this. We're going to take over. It's now martial law. When does that happen? That happens in less than a year. Because there's just too much fighting and there's like these all these little kind of revolutions within the city of factions trying to take control. And the federal government says, enough, Oklahoma City. This is nonsense. We control you now. Just hang out. And it's not, again, until 1907 that things kind of normalize a little bit and you get an actual U.S. state. How do Oklahoma City residents today kind of view their history? Like, are they proud of this kind of crazy beginning? Yeah, they are. And in fact, for many generations of Oklahoma school children, it was traditional on April 22nd to recreate the land run out on the <laughs> That playground. sounds like a really bad idea with school children. Yeah, there's these amazing pictures. I've got one in my book of, of kids and they're all dressed up in like pioneer cosplay and they're, they've got little red wagons and they've formed, you know, teams and alliances and families and they're just running across the playground to claim a plot. With like toy guns and sticks? I don't know if they actually had toy guns, but they've got the cowboy hats and everything and and they've got the stakes. Yeah. And I talked to a lot of people who this was part of their childhood. They've just now started to think twice about this. Mm -hmm. And because, of course, there are a lot of ancestors of those original indigenous people who are still there and kind of like, hi, guys, we're still here. What, What are we romanticizing when we do this with our children? So there I actually spoke to a guy, this guy, J.B. Williams, who's an activist and rapper from the east side of the city. And he said his mother, he came home from school and said, we did this thing in the playground today. It was really fun. And his mom said that land was not the settler's land to take. The black citizens of Oklahoma City were certainly not invited to take part in this. No son of mine will ever do this again. And so he had to, from that point on, kind of sit on the sidelines and watch or stay home from school that day. Did you know about any of this when you went into Oklahoma City to cover the Thunder basketball? No, No, I didn't know about any of it. And that's why this idea, I've been waiting my whole writing career. So at the point I started this, probably 10 years or so for a subject to grab me and insist that I make it into my first book. And Mm -hmm. this was the one. And it was really reading some of that history on the airplane out to write about a basketball team where my jaw dropped. And I was like, I've never heard these stories. I can't believe this happened in America this recently. And then every chapter of the city's history was kind of a crazy, exaggerated version of what a normal American city would do in, in a similar way. So every single point of this story amazed me. And that's why I had to write the book. How do you bring all this together? You've got the basketball team, you've got the founding of the city, and you really take it up through the Oklahoma City bombing, with mm-hmm. Timothy, Timothy McVeigh, and yeah, through the oil and gas booms and busts mm-hmm. and fracking. And how do you sort of gather all that together into a narrative, which you described earlier before we started as weird? Yeah, it's a weird narrative. I struggled a lot with the structure for this book. I knew it was a story of many different levels, many different characters kind of winding in and through each other because of the size of the city. People like to say it's the, it's either the smallest big city in America or the biggest small city in America. How big Every, is it? It's, it's one of those cities that's like 600,000 ish in the, you know, in the actual core. And then if you expand to include all the suburbs, it's like a little over a million. Mm-hmm. And Everything is so intensely interconnected. I mean, you mentioned the bombing. One of the striking facts that I learned early was that every basketball player who joins the Thunder before he ever plays a game goes to the bombing memorial and takes a tour of the bombing memorial so that he understands the community that he is representing publicly. They see these things as intimately linked. Mm -hmm. And a lot of residents talk about the basketball team, which came in 2008, 
as a kind of healing of the community from that tragedy of the bombing of, of, of a public thing that people could rally around and feel joy about. And so you have these intense interconnections and I wanted the book to reflect that. So the narrative structure is this kind of, I mean, it's really a kind of weaving of stories from different eras about different characters together. And so you get these short sections about, say, the land run, and then you get a short section about the basketball team, and then you get a short section about the civics of the city, urban renewal or something. And these several narratives kind of rise and crest together and culminate together at the end of the book. But it was a really tricky process. I started to think about it as a kind of literary land run Mm -hmm. where you just had all these things thrown together and they had to kind of create their own kind of order. So You've spent most of your career sort of in two major roles, if I'm not mistaken, as a magazine journalist Mm -hmm. and a feature writer and as a book critic. So I would imagine that 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 experience, those two areas of experience can both help and perhaps hinder or inhibit you in the writing of your first book. Sure. Yeah, maybe being a book critic did make me a little more careful about choosing a subject for my first book and committing to it Mm -hmm. because I knew how easy it is as a critic to read something and be unimpressed. I wanted to make sure I was putting everything I could into it to impress whatever critics might get their hands on it. (laughs) Yeah, the writing process was hard, but it should be hard, right? I mean, writing a book is hard. Because it is actually hard. Right. It's, a, it's hard so to much make. mental work. You're asking the reader to do so much mental work to sit there and like, it's this, you know, thinking about it in 2018, holding a book in your hands, it's this weird kind of technology that you, that seems kind of inert. It's just sitting there, but it is this incredibly powerful technology that you just have to activate with your mind. You have to sit there and activate it with your mind. And when you do, hopefully it kind of sweeps you away and takes you to an entirely new world. And yeah, that's what I tried to do. All right. I want to go back to that, the McVeigh bombing, because you mentioned that the, the Thunder was founded in 2008. That's mm-hmm. 13 years after the, the bombing. Right. We're now 23 years yeah. after the bombing. How present is it among, sort of in, in that city today? Very present. Very. I mean, it is literally central. This building was in the middle of downtown, the federal building, and now is one of the most beautiful and powerful memorials I've ever been to anywhere in the world. And so anywhere you go downtown, you're going to pass this thing. I think, I think I went to the memorial every single day I was in Oklahoma city just because it's right there and you walk right through, there's no entrance fee or anything to walk through the grounds. So it's very central and you have, I mean, just generations of trauma still echoing through the people. And it was, Again, before the thunder came, before the city had this kind of recent renaissance, it was the defining quality of Oklahoma City. It was the thing that people knew about Oklahoma City. And so when I tell people I'm writing this book, that's what they'd always say, oh, is it about the bombing? And I'd say, well, the bombing is in it. The bombing comes into it actually quite late. I think somebody told me page 347, you get the bombing. And that was because I wanted to establish this place as a real city where humans live and, you know, love each other and work and have normal lives. And then when you get to this bombing, you realize how many levels it hit the city on and you you kind of hurt with the people as the bombing happens. I'm sure the sentiment is not monolithic, but what kinds of things did you hear from people in terms of the impact, the lasting impact that the bombing had on them? I think one of the main things, one of the positive things that came out of it that you hear a lot is that it, you know, it sounds like a cliche, but it brought the city together, which is saying something. I go over in the book, the 20th century history of Oklahoma City is quite intense. As I said, every every motion that a normal American city made, this place made times 100. So, like what? so every city at some point dabbled in the movement called urban renewal, mm-hmm. where, well, you have these old brick buildings, you have things that are kind of shabby and run down. Let's knock them down with bulldozers. Let's blow them up with dynamite. Let's build modern glass buildings and kind of revitalize downtown. Well, Oklahoma City did that more than any city in the country, even though it was the youngest major city in the country. It hired actually the architect I.M. Pei, who was very young at the time, and he came in and came up with this plan. I have a map of it in my book. All of downtown is just shaded, like almost literally every building. And shaded means it's coming down. And Mm -hmm. he had this grand vision, and the city planners just bought right into it, of a downtown that would recapture all the energy that was flowing out to the suburbs by building these 
huge like cathedrals of glass shopping malls and glass <laughs> skyscrapers. And so they just, I mean, people said it looked like a post-World War II sort of German firebombed city. It yeah. was just an empty downtown. And then the economy busted and they didn't rebuild. And so you had a couple glass skyscrapers that went up, but you had a downtown that was essentially entirely empty lots. What's the time period here? This this is 60s, 70s. Mm-hmm. And so by really by the early 80s, you have this blank canvas of a downtown that's waiting to be redrawn and the money goes out of the economy. And so you have weedy, empty lots that define downtown for decades until it rebuilds in the late 90s, early 2000s. So you have this place that at the same time is expanding radically. It became the largest city by land area on the face of the earth. It was nearly seven. It went from a normal size city, which is Uh like 80 square miles, which is what Baltimore is officially, to it went through a thing called the Great Annexation, where city planners said, we want to control everything that happens in this city and around it. We're not going to let these suburbs ring us around and hem us in. We're going to claim all the land we can. And it went from 80 square miles to nearly 700 square miles at its peak. It, it passed. Oh, that? This was in the 60s. Mm-hmm. And this was in a matter of a couple of years. It was really in months. The city just started multiplying, multiplying. It so was they like, wanted to prevent that suburbanization by exactly. just kind of grabbing it. Yeah, they pointed to cities like Pittsburgh, which is this grand old city, but its suburbs became independent towns and Mm -hmm. really were like a straitjacket and Pittsburgh couldn't expand. And Oklahoma City said, not us. We can learn from the lessons of these old cities. And so they sprawled like no other American city sprawled. And the people, of course, fled that blasted downtown. This was happening kind of at the same time and moved out into these suburbs. And so you had this population that was radically unnaturally dispersed and you had this feeling that Oklahoma City wasn't even really a city it was this huge sprawling place with cows and horses and it was a territory and there was nothing to to rally around downtown there was no reason to come there and so when the bombing happens in 95 when the city is really at its lowest point it takes this blow right in the center of that downtown and it kind of brought people back together it gave them a common identity all of a sudden again. It reminded them that they, oh yeah, we do live in a city. Our fortunes are tied together. And it was at that point that the city really started rallying to figure out what it was and rebuild itself. Mm -hmm. And the citizens were actually convinced somehow, this is a very conservative place, convinced to tax themselves to raise money to rebuild downtown, to build, for instance, a sports arena, which is eventually what got them the thunder all those years later. And now they have this arena where 18,000 people come 40 plus times a year to kind of cheer for Oklahoma City, which is just something that would have been an incredible, improbable fantasy, you know, 20 years ago. So sort of a a rare new source of civic pride. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You said that it brought people together. Was Oklahoma City particularly fractured in terms of its population and how diverse is it? So... Yes and no. It's so it was fractured because of the things that I the kind of civic shape of it was Mm -hmm. very strange. And that lends itself to fracturing in terms of racial diversity. It has a pretty large black population. It's about 15 percent of the city population. And that's a story I tell in the book as well. And of course, that was a fracture from the very start, as it was in most American cities. I imagine they weren't among those first 10,000. They were not. There were some historians kind of disagree about how many were there, but they certainly were not welcome as the face of the land run. In fact, there were idealistic black leaders who thought maybe this unassigned land might actually become an all black state before the land run happened. Of course, that that never got close to coming true. The railroads were too powerful. The settlers were too powerful. So the black population from the very beginning was marginalized during the land run. Most of them came in after the land run. And then, of course, all the worst land was left in the city. So their neighborhoods settled there. They didn't get nearly the infrastructure, the the portion of the taxes that the other parts of town got. And they were pretty harshly segregated in every way. I mean, it was a real Jim Crow state once Oklahoma became a state. And so one of the stories I tell in the book is there's a, there's a great unknown civil rights triumph that happened in Oklahoma City, which was in the late 50s. In 1958, 
so well before like Greensboro and the famous sit-ins that we normally talk about, there was a sustained series of sit-ins in downtown Oklahoma City, hmm. led by this incredibly charismatic, energetic school teacher named Clara Looper. And she walked 13 children down to Cat's drugstore in the center of the city, and they sat at the soda fountain counter and they ordered Cokes and they just sat there. And they came back the next day and did it again, and the next day and did it again until Cat's changed its policy and said, fine, we are now integrated, not only in Oklahoma, but it was a chain all over. And then they went systematically through the rest of downtown for six years until they had integrated all of Oklahoma City. And that was done relatively peacefully. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that that is one of the great strains in the history of Oklahoma City is Clara Looper was able to work with the police force, which was, of course, majority white, and tell them, here's what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. And the police force helped make sure there was no major outbreak of violence. So there is there is this strain through the city's history of kind of coming to the brink of civil war and then figuring out a way to diffuse it and work together. All right. We can't have a complete conversation in any way about this book without talking about some of the booms in the title. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the first kind of boom. Well, I mean, the first obvious boom, I think, was the land run. And then after which, the again, the settlers were nearly starving to death. And it took a while for a second boom to come. And the first boom was this kind of agricultural boom where they got a lot of rain and all of this produce swept into the city. And they were the kind of railroad hub that everything went through. So the economy really boomed and they were building skyscrapers, you know, eight, nine stories tall. And you don't get the next huge boom until... The late 20s. Actually, it's driving Oklahoma City crazy because Tulsa is booming with oil from mm -hmm. the early 20th century on into the teens. And they're just, I mean, their skyscrapers are these art deco huge things. And Oklahoma City can't find it. And then finally, in 1928, they find the oil that's sitting underneath them. It turns out to be the second largest lake of oil in the world, right under Oklahoma City. And the whole city fills up with oil derricks. I mean, there are pictures of this, and it just looks like... It looks like this industrial sort of post-apocalyptic landscape. And and that's when you get kind of what is still the defining features of the of the cityscape now, these huge skyscrapers that are 30-some stories tall. So does that insulate the city from the Great Depression? It does, actually. Yeah, it hits right then. Hmm. So they're booming. They're making these skyscrapers. Now, they would have boomed harder had the Great Depression not hit, but they were able to ride it out in a way that a lot of other cities weren't. Similarly, in the early 20th century, I mean, 21st century, when the rest of the world hits this huge economic meltdown in 2008, Oklahoma City, again, is riding this kind of fracking wave. And so they're, again, a little bit insulated and are able to inch ahead of other cities, which are crashing, and they're able to build kind of these, their new huge skyscrapers and, and downtown features. But one of the unintended consequences of the fracking is an increase in Earthquakes, yeah. which makes you kind of glad that those skyscrapers weren't all glass, as in the original yeah, right. IMP yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, design. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, as with most American cities, the earthquakes aren't hitting Oklahoma City directly. It's mm -hmm. all the, the wealth kind of flows to Oklahoma City, and the bad consequences kind of happen around the state. But yeah, you get this this place that was, you know, it's not tectonically active really, is suddenly having more earthquakes than California, and it was funny watching the local news grapple with this. Very much support. I mean, the whole, again, the place is so interconnected. So much of their money comes from this energy industry stuff that the local news was like, well, we don't know what it is. It may be from this drought. The water levels changed in a lake. Maybe that caused the earthquakes. And then it just became undeniable. As year after year, the earthquakes were in the hundreds and they were getting stronger and stronger and stronger. So booms are usually accompanied by busts. Mm -hmm. I imagine you cover many of those in this book, but you also argue that or pose the question, you know, that that this city could become a world-class metropolis. Mm -hmm. That's always been its fantasy. What do you think? I think it is a world-class city in terms of being a fascinating place that has a city like no other city on earth. It's world-class in that sense. Because of that odd history, because of, I think, the personality of the place that it that it got from that odd history, I don't think it will ever be an absolute world world class metropolis. But I think it will continue to be maybe the most interesting American city if people will look at it. 
Okay, I have to ask you one last question then, yep. because uh, you wrote this great feature for the magazine last year about Mount Rushmore, another oh, great thanks. iconic American landscape that drew me to South Dakota after reading that story. What would you most recommend a visitor to go check out, to see, to do in Oklahoma City? I would say start at the bombing memorial because that's where you feel, you kind of feel the defining event of the modern city. And from there, you can walk to all kinds of interesting places. But, but that's where you really feel that downtown Oklahoma City has this incredible, strange feeling. If you've been to New York, if you've been to Chicago, any of the world's major cities, it doesn't feel like that. It is truly a Great Plains city, and you can feel the Great Plains in the city. The streets, this is partly a remnant of urban renewal, the streets are very wide. The blocks are very large, mm -hmm. and you feel there's this constant wind that's coming from the south. It's, it's so insistently coming from the south that the trees actually lean to the north. Hmm. If you ever get lost, people say, look at the trees, they point north. And so you feel this wind, which has been coming constantly for just eons, and to me, it's almost like you can feel the time, like the deep time of the Great Plains just blowing over you in this spread out, almost empty city. So just go to the memorial and then just walk all the streets around it and feel that wind. And I feel like it's history sort of touching you. Then go to Elemental Coffee because it's very good coffee. <laughs> okay. Good to know. Sam, thanks so much. You're a book critic with your first book out. That has to be scary, but it's gotten a great reception so far. So congratulations. Really nice. yeah. Thank you very much. Sam Anderson is the author of Boomtown, the fantastical saga of Oklahoma City, its chaotic founding, its apocalyptic weather, its purloined basketball team, and the dream of becoming a world-class metropolis. So here's a request for our listeners. I get lots of feedback from you, some complaints, lots of kind words. Really appreciate it. You can always reach me directly at books at nytimes.com. I will write back. But you can also, if you feel moved to do so, review us on any platform where you download the podcast, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play or somewhere else. Please feel free to review us and, of course, email us at any time. Joining us now, two of my colleagues here at The Times, David Enrich, the finance editor of The Times, as well as the author, most recently, of his first book, The Spider Network, about the LIBOR scandal, and Andrew Ross Sorkin, who is a many-titled person, a columnist for The Times, the editor of Dealbook, an editor-at-large for The New York Times, and author of Too Big to Fail. Which has just been reissued to mark the 10-year anniversary of the financial crisis with a new afterword connecting Trump's election to the very crisis. Excellent. It's a direct well, line. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. We're here to talk about finance in fiction, using as a jumping off point recent book by Gary Steingart, his latest, Lake Success, which both of you have read. Tell us a little bit about what this book is about and what the connection is to finance. Well, the connection to finance is very direct. This is a book whose main character, the protagonist, is a hedge fund manager named Barry. And Barry Cohen. Barry Cohen. And he is a, he a very successful hedge fund manager in some ways and a very unsuccessful hedge fund manager in other ways. And this is his effort to kind of come to grips with his life as it spins out of control. And so it's it's a rare book with a rare piece of fiction anyway with a main character being a finance guy. And it's fascinating. Let's talk about what that success is and isn't. I mean, is he a success financially? Well, he initially is a success financially, but his hedge fund, which is called This Point of Capital, yep. runs into very hard times, kind of unravels, and with it, his life unravels. And so he tries to reinvent himself, and that brings him, takes him on this kind of wild journey that, or at least wild for a hedge fund guy. It's the kind of journey that normal people probably take all the time. But what he, kind of journey is that? On a Greyhound, a Greyhound bus. So he travels from the Port Authority bus terminal just right across the street from where we are now, down through Maryland and Virginia, all the way down to Texas, and then further on, further afield from that as well. And he, you know, experiences America in the way that most hedge fund managers 
Most of the point oh 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 one percent do not have an understanding of. Yeah, and it's unclear whether Barry has an understanding of it either. He experiences it. He's for most of the book, he's lugging around a little suitcase that's filled with his basically the only asset he has left, which mm-hmm. is his very expensive set of watches. So most people don't think of hedge fund managers as a kind of suffering class of Americans. Is this contemporary? Is this a financial crisis? What oh, is- no, this is a very contemporary story. Uh, to me, this is a story as much about this particular character who unto himself, at least for me, was fascinating. I mean, I, I by the way, throughout as I was reading this book, my wife would get upset with me because I would be laughing out loud at these sort of remarkable little lines. But to me, it captured the intersection of what we might think of as the 1% and the rest of America today and encapsulated so much of, of the, the debate and dialogue around inequality in America in some ways because it's sort of it sort of created these distinctions between his world and everybody else's world. And it also sort of captured New York mm-hmm. today. It captured this sort of sense of politics. There, there's an overlay around Trump's election and what it means to the country. There's a sense of materialism, not just among the 1%, but among everybody. Mm-hmm. And this sense that we are all Uh, putting price tags on everything and everybody and how much, you know, if you're wearing a watch, whether it's the shirt you're wearing or the watch you're wearing or the countertops, there's all of these little... He he measures sips of whiskey by how much the sips would cost. And often we're talking tens of thousands of dollars a sip. I don't know if you ever remember Fight Club early on. Mm -hmm. There's that moment where I think it's Ikea furniture, but the price tag is put up on the screen of every little item. Right. And and that's sort of what's happening in his world that's all the, the time. That's the way he sees things. He's walking into a, a a big kitchen, a beautiful kitchen, and he's saying, you know, how much this costs and how much this costs and how much this costs. And then also questioning how is it that these other, you know, he'll walk into somebody else's apartment and say, how do they afford that? How, how much are they worth? How much are they getting paid? And everybody's doing the math on everybody else. And there's something, I hate to be cynical about it, but I think there's something very true about that in today's America, whether it's part of the 1% or much broader than that. I, you know, I, the thing I would quibble about with that is that I don't think it's the top 1%. We're talking the top maybe thousandth yes, of yes. 1% here. And it's – but it's very it, – it rang very true to me how – there's a line in there at the toward the beginning of the book that when he's kind of defending to himself and his wife and a person that lives in their very expensive apartment building, albeit many floors below him, so in a much less expensive apartment than his, that – the reason he earns tens of millions of dollars a year and someone else who works just as hard earns you know, a tiny fraction of that is that it's not that he cares about the money, he says. It's that money is the scorecard that people in his class and his world use to measure success. And so while – you know, journalists like us yearn for Pulitzer Prizes or recognition or people who make movies. We don't care about uh, money at all. No, we don't. (laughs) God, (laughs) uh, let's not go there. That's for them. It's a scorecard. It's a way. It's a game. And money, he says, with kind of a wink almost, that this is what this is a way of keeping track. It's not that they yearn for these material things quite as much. Well, Gary Steingart is very successful as a novelist. He wrote Super Sad Love Story, Absurdistan, The Russian Debutante's Handbook. He also wrote a fantastic memoir most recently, Little Failure. And he's captured that whole sort of Russian-American immigrant world. How well does he get finance? Does he, do, you, do you sense that he sort of did his research, understands this? To, the to me, this is as close to... And we were talking about it before, this idea of Bonfire of the Vanities. I mean, there are very few books, few novels that really capture Wall Street in its moment. And to me, you know, and we know, by the way, because you wrote this piece in The New Yorker all about Novogratz. Novogratz. We should probably say who Novogratz is. He's a guy who runs a hedge fund most famous for making big bets on cryptocurrencies. And clearly, Barry Cohn, who's the main protagonist in this story, seems to be based at least at least elements of Novogratz is in there. And so mm-hmm. I think he did a lot of research. Having said that, this whole, st- you know, what's so interesting is part of the story takes place in New York, but then all of a sudden he leaves New York. And that's what creates this great juxtaposition around today's modern Wall Street. 
Yeah, and I, I agree with that. There's a tremendous amount of research that goes that went into this. He spent a lot of time with hedge fund managers. You read the acknowledgement section of the yep. book, and he, it's not just hedge fund managers he spent time with, but it's journalists who write about hedge fund managers. And um, if, if I, you, and you, neither of you were a source nope, of this. No, okay. I, I, I wasn't. If I had one critique of the book, it's that you know the references strewn throughout the book to his NetJets account or his, you know, working out at Equinox or other little things, little perks of everyday life that the top tenth of a percent or hundredth of a percent enjoy. At, at, at points, though, I felt that that was a little bit like, you know, he was sprinkling in his little bits of research into the book to make the character seem real. And to me, the thing that made him seem real was kind of the psychological drama he was going with, his struggles with his autistic kid, his struggles in his marriage, mm-hmm. his struggles kind of, kind of coming to terms with all these people in his past who had in some ways done better than him in other ways were kind of struggling. And the, the psych, I, I, I'm a huge Gary Steingart fan. And to me, the thing he's best at, and that was the best thing about this book is this person's individual kind of journey. The, the finance elements of it to me, it almost seemed like this was that, that Barry Cohn became a composite sketch of your stereotypical hedge fund manager. And there were elements of the kind of nerdy, kind of on the spectrum math guy. There are elements of the big swing dick. There are elements of the guy who's doing insider trading. And to me, that those are all true personality types or personality profiles in the hedge fund world. I've never before encountered one who embodies all of them the way Barry Cohen does. Well, this is, I think, a challenge for anyone writing about finance, among other challenges, is sort of the the characters, because they aren't inherently sympathetic for the, you know, 99.999% of other Americans who don't make hedge fund kind of salaries. And you both have dealt with this in your in your own writing both in your journalism and in your books that, you know, is it hard to kind of round out a character who works in finance to make so, that you know person? What? I actually think that's one of the most, dare I say, even unfair accusations around characters on Wall Street. Mm-hmm. The, the reason why I've always loved writing about the world of Wall Street is because I'm so damn fascinated by these characters. And I think we all have these impressions. And I know, especially when I first started doing this job, actually, that you know, these are all sort of these two-dimensional characters. And if you have a ton of money, you know, life just must be grand. Mm-hmm. And there's an element where, by the way, life is grand. So I don't want to I don't want to underplay that element of it. But I would actually argue that the money makes them even more complicated than than just about anything. How so? Because I, you know, as as David said, the money really is the scorecard. If you look at most of them, the most successful people, business people I know mm-hmm. are some of the most insecure people in the world that I know. I would actually argue that their success is in large part driven by that insecurity, insecurity that you would never think in reality they should ever have given all of the money in the bank and the assets and the staff and the team around them. And so trying to understand that psychology to me is fascinating. And that's to me what I think and, and David said this, that's what Gary gets so well about. The, by the way, and Barry is that. Mm-hmm. Barry, Barry, there is a chip on Barry's shoulder and an insecurity that is driving all of this. All right. Well, here's um, now I'm getting into like the nuances within the finance world, but he's a hedge fund manager, right? In Bonfire of the Vanities, he, the main character is an investment banker, correct? And these are sort of two very different character types, right, on Wall Street? Yeah. And this is kind of the critique that I was getting at with it, that I think there's a little bit of you know, they're amalgamating this one character into a composite character because there are moments where Barry has this kind of swashbuckling, kind of of like he's a salesman and he shows off his salesman side. That masters of the universe kind of. Exactly. Hugely charismatic, self-confident, or at least projecting an image of self-confidence, even if it's, you know, covering up inner insecurities. And on the other hand, he's got this traitor side, which is the quintessential, or at least now in these days where everything is so computer driven, this is the type that on Wall Street now is dominated by nerds and people with, you know, engineering backgrounds often, many of them on the autism spectrum and who are also, by the way, fascinating characters. I mean, that's, that's the guy I wrote a book about the spider network, which I'll plug is about a guy who is an engineering and kind of physics guy who, and on the spectrum who is a trader. These are very different types of people. And I, I, I think they are all, motivated in many ways by the same 
need to prove themselves. And a lot of them have come from backgrounds that are, you know, that they weren't brought up necessarily in the in very affluent neighborhoods or in affluent parts of the country. Many of them weren't even brought up in this country. And it, those are very different personality types, even if they're driven by the same base insecurities. The world of finance also, I think, is incomprehensible to many of us. I will include me very neatly in this category. People just don't understand that world. Is it difficult to explain it in fiction or even in narrative nonfiction in a way that readers will get? So, look, there's complicated issues in the world of business, in the world of finance. But at least for me, in terms of how I've approached my reporting for The Times, how I approached writing Too Big to Fail, I think how you approached writing your book, David, as much as we talk about these big companies and institutions and and talk about the big numbers and the math, it's ultimately a story about people. Mm-hmm. These are people stories. And these are, these are stories about why people are doing something and why they're trying to win or lose and who they're trying to screw over and what their motivations and where the, the machinations and incentives are. That's what these stories ultimately are. And the best ones are the ones that actually understand the psychology of all of this. Yes, you have to, to some degree, understand some of these concepts, and some of the concepts can be a little complicated, but I think that once you get behind that, the stories sort of unfold and, and in ways make actually some of the more complicated things that on the surface seem complicated actually very, very basic and simple. I completely agree with that, by the way. The best stories are about humans, and that's what any good piece of fiction or narrative nonfiction is going to be based on, is you're going to have characters and you're going to get to understand things from their perspective. But I also think that Wall Street over the past two or three decades has done a great job of making itself seem much more complicated than it really needs to be. A lot of Mm -hmm. the concepts that make it so mysterious and opaque and unimaginably difficult for most people to understand are actually, when boiled down to their essence, not that complicated. And I, you know, there are a lot of things I love about this book. I don't think Steingart really even tries to, try to do that, to do that mm-hmm. which is fine. One of the risks of writing about finance, whether it's in fiction or nonfiction, is that people hear the, that word finance and it terrifies them and it makes them think they're not going to understand it or they're going to be bored by it. And that is, it's a challenge to be able to explain complicated things and boil them down, but it's by no means impossible. It sounds like this book, Gary Steingart's Like Success, as well as your book, The Spider Network, David, and Too Big to Fail, Andrew, and even Bonfire the Vanities are all in a certain way about crises and downfall and then perhaps rising up again in some in some way. So it's interesting that they are also about a, a very certain kind of narrative that it seems people are interested in. It's a soap in. opera. It's mm-hmm. a so, it's, it's just, it's a mo- all of these are modern day soap operas and money and greed, to some degree, are the drivers. But as I think we said earlier, also, it's insecurity. It's about trying to prove something, whether it's to your best friend or to your mother, about who you are and what you're capable of. And that that's a concept that I don't think is inherent to business. I think that's a concept that's inherent to life. So I asked both of you to think hard about the best books, fiction, that have captured the world of finance before coming on the podcast. And you both kind of came up with a similar answer. So Such a cliche, right? Well, I think the more telling thing is what we didn't come up with, which is that we both, and this is, I give Andrew credit, and he he was the one who immediately thought of Bonfire of the Vanities. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. So I get to say it first. And <laughs> But we really struggled to think of many examples. There's not – this is a a topic that is is filled with drama and high stakes and crazy people. And yet it's been off limits for the most part for – or at least undesirable, seemingly undesirable for serious fiction writers to tackle. And I think that's one of – I got so excited when I saw that Gary Steingart, who's one of my favorite authors, was writing a book with a hedge fund manager as the main character. That was just – and I think I tweeted at the time that this is just the perfect combination for me. And it's be- partly because there are so few attempts to tackle this. Well, now that you've read the book, where does this fit in in terms of your hierarchy of Gary Steingart novels and memoir? If yeah, memoir. I was going to say Little Failure is one of my favorites. I and mean, I think it probably I haven't read Absurdistan, but I have read Super Sad True Love Story and Russian Debbie Dantan book. And my favorite is definitely Russian Debbie Dantan book. Probably Little Failure comes next. I don't know if this or Super Sad True Love Story would be in third or fourth place, mm-hmm. but they're all good. And I'm, you know, I everyone should read it. Why do you think so few people 
write about finance and fiction? I think there's two real reasons. One is is the one that you alluded to earlier, which is that readers are intimidated by the idea of finance. And so getting over that hurdle unto itself, I think, is is something for most writers. And I give Gary enormous credit for even trying. I think the second piece is is also, and maybe it's embedded in this idea of what of the way the public thinks about finance, which is this idea that these characters, that there's nothing sympathetic about these characters. Mm-hmm. It's hard for a reader to empathize with these people and therefore that the stakes can't be that big. Meaning, and this is true of any, any kind of story where you're trying to capture this dramatic tension. David and I look think of big money as great tension. Mm-hmm. These people, people think their lives are on the line. But if you're really, if you can take a step back, are their lives really on the line? If they're going to make an extra million dollars or not? When they're already making 20 and $30 million, not really. And so right. it's sort of how do you create that dramatic tension? Nobody's dying on the table. You know what I mean? And, and I think that's why it, it's complicated for writers to, to focus on this. And that's why, but I think Gary did a great job. You mentioned how it's hard to develop or kind of create a sense of empathy for main Wall Street characters, especially people of the kind of that have some villain, a vil, villainous, villainous qualities. Quali- yeah. yeah, villainous qualities in them. Which I Barry Cohen villains. definitely, I love villainous too. And I, I absolutely <laughs> love reading about it and love writing about it. But it is very hard to create empathy for people like that. So my question is, did did you have empathy for Barry Cohen? So there were elements of empathy I had for Barry. I actually thought that he did such a good job of making Barry so realistic in many ways that it actually created a little bit of an empathy problem for me. Because while I wanted to desperately empathize with certain parts of him. There were other parts that I just couldn't empathize with at all that made him almost seem subhuman at certain points. So, you know, you, you had asked about, you know, how you rank these books. I loved his memoir. I, I think this is a great book. I, I don't want to give a spoiler away. I actually think this book is fabulous. And then we've talked about it. There's a moment where I feel like it veers or turns in a place that, that sort of undid some of my enthusiasm mm-hmm. for it that would not by the way prevent me from reading it at all so if you're listening go go read it i think it's it's fun all right before i let you both go we've talked about how there's a really limited kind of sphere of finance fiction but non-fiction writers have not hesitated to take the subject on obviously leaving out your two excellent books the spider network and too big to fail what's your favorite book about finance andrew oh goodness well Newest book that's out and about right now is Bad Blood, uh, mm-hmm. the book about Theranos. Is the a, John Carry You. It's a very well done book, no question. Having said that, and he's a colleague. You're stealing Did I steal mine. it from? Okay. I can go somewhere no, else no, with no, you. No, no, it's fine. I, it's fine, I will it's go fine. My, my two favorites, which I think anyone who's interested in business has to read, is Den of Thieves by Jim Stewart, who's now a columnist at the New York Times. The Master. At, and of course, Barbarians at the Gate by Brian Burroughs. I mean, those those were really, I think, they 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 created so much of the model for this type of narrative. All right, David, did he steal your thunder? He he stole both of my. Those are kind of foundational works in this kind of genre that Andrew and I both aspire to. The other, the one I would add to that is Roger Lowenstein's When Genius Failed, which is about the collapse of long term capital management, and is just a work of like brilliant narrative nonfiction, but also really brings you inside this world of finance in a kind of sophisticated, subtle, interesting way. Oh, I have one. I totally forgot because it actually is legitimately one of the best business narratives in history and is so underappreciated. The Informant by Kurt Eichenwald. Mm -hmm. Put the movie aside. I didn't love the movie, but the book is outrageous. And it's outrageous because the quotes are so real because they're all on tape, secretly taped by the informant. Well, Kurt has a new book coming out this fall. And David, you're also working on another book. What's that book about? When's that coming? It is about Deutsche Bank Mm -hmm. and President Trump and a crazy quest to understand one man's death. And it is coming out. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully before the presidential election. So All right. By the way, hold on. We managed there. to have this whole conversation without mentioning one of the also great author, great writers in the world that, that do this. For Michael little, Lewis. Michael Lewis. Yeah. So Liars Poker is oh. that, such a cliche at this point because it is one of the best ever. Well, he has another book coming this fall, too. So he lots, does? Yes, he does. Lots so prolific. coming for readers. Is that the Audible one or the? No, the Audible is like an excerpt of, of what will be in a larger narrative coming in October. Until then, Andrew Ross Sorkin, thank you so much for being here. David Enrich, thank you. Thank you. you. 
joining us now, Alexander Alter, here to talk about what the latest is in the publishing world. Hi, Alexander. Hi, Pamela. So there was some news this week. There's a book that's coming out next week that everyone is talking about, basically, in the entire country. It is, of course, Bob Woodward's book about the Trump administration. The title is Fear. And as often happens with these heavily embargoed, highly newsworthy books, it leaked early. The Washington Post wrote about it. We wrote about it. And it's been all over cable news. And it's interesting to see another book about the Trump administration coming on the heels of Omarosa's book and of Michael Wolff's book, Fire and Fury, that paints this portrait of an administration in chaos. But I think what's different about this one, you know, it shares some similarities in terms of the themes and even some of the sources, I think, with earlier books. And it's certainly on track to be a huge bestseller. It's already number one on Amazon. But I think what's different is it's a little harder for critics of the authors of these books to dismiss because Woodward has such a long track record as a very meticulous and um, well-sourced Washington journalist going back to the Nixon era. He's written books about Obama and Clinton and George Bush. And I think, you know, he's basically put out his one sentence statement, I stand by my reporting. And it's it's a little trickier for people to sort of throw this in the same category as, you know, tell-alls by a former employee. Right. One thing that interests me is when a book like this leaks and they have carefully orchestrated a media sort of rollout, including appearances on major TV shows, which do their bookings well in advance. Like, how do they ever change the media lineup? Do they ever, like, move up the interviews? Because with this book, I know Bob Woodward is not doing his first talk show, I believe, until Sunday. You know, I had that same question, and I thought it was actually pretty clever of Henry Holt to do that with Michael Wolff's book. I to think move that- the interview. Up. They not only moved up the interviews, they put the book on sale the day that it leaked. Mm-hmm. Around the time that President Trump threatened them with a libel lawsuit, they said, you know what? Here, everyone, you can read it now. Of course, the book was out of stock immediately, but people could read the ebook. And Michael Wolf had wall to wall television appearances. And I do think there's something to be said for that approach. Simon and Schuster's hand, not done that this year. They have not. The, the book is not available yet. It comes out next Tuesday. And I think there might be a strategy there as well, which is that. That, well, right now it's getting covered as news and they can maybe draw the media's attention span a little bit by then trotting him out when the book is on sale so that he'll get additional coverage then, provided that there's not some other new flashy thing to, to talk about. But I do think it's interesting. I, I, I thought Henry Holt's approach, which was unusual to make the book available before the planned on sale date to make the author available, I think that really did boost his sales early on. And that book has now sold millions of copies. Is, and I believe it's the most sold book of 2018 on Amazon already. I'm really curious, too, about what you think about the leak of this book early, because the leak happened in The Washington Post, which is, of course, Bob Woodward's own newspaper. It seems unlikely that someone's employer would purposefully leak one of their reporters' books. It is interesting because I always thought they would have an early crack at this and maybe the first excerpt because he is so closely associated with the Washington Post. You know, there was an attempt to embargo this book. I was sort of surprised that it went there first, that they didn't have sort of an excerpt or more official kind of rollout of it there. What are people saying? Like, do they think that the Post leaked it early on purpose? Was it all coordinated from the beginning? You know, I actually, with books like this, there's always a scramble to get your hands on them. And I'm sure there were a number of copies floating around, particularly in Washington. Mm -hmm. So I did think if anyone was going to get it early, it was probably going to be somebody down there. But You know, it actually held longer than I thought it might. I mean, the book goes on sale next week, and so it could have happened earlier. But I know that there was an attempt to sort of delay the shipping of it and things like that. All right. Well, sounds like it has the potential to be another big book. I assume it will be, (laughs) Thanks, Alexandra. Thanks for having me. Joining us now to talk about what's going on in the world of literary criticism are critics Pearl Sagal, Dwight Garner, and Jen Salai. Hey, guys. Hi, Hi, Pamela. Hi, Pamela. So you had a big book come out this week, unexpectedly, Dwight. Yeah, big big and early. The new Bob Woodward book is here. And, and you know, it's been a long time since anybody really looked forward to a Bob Woodward book. And, and, and the, um, <laughs> you know, right. the anticipation for this one was enormous. You know, it's called Fear. I forget the subtitle, but something like, you know, Inside the Trump White House. You know, I read it. I was a little disappointed. 
I will say. It's a very, it's very poorly written. Bob Woodward has never been the most graceful writer, but it's it's so sort of just, you know, slap boarded together, it feels like. He doesn't do a lot of the scene setting he used to do. And I, you kind of want the details from Trump. You want the gold, you, you want the gold chairs and you want, I don't know, I wanted more sensory details from Woodward. But I think he's been criticized for that in the past, for lingering on that kind of stuff. So in this book, he's very direct. The scenes he sets tend to be uh, debates over key issues, you know, South Korea, Iran, uh, trade, tariffs. So it's, it's a very serious book. There are a few wild details that maybe we can talk about. But, um, you know, the big stories have already been out there. I mean, the fact that people are stealing documents from his desk so he can't see them and act on his worst impulses. Crucially, this book just makes him out to be, you know, an utter congenital liar. That's, that's just underlined over and over again. You know, basically, this book says the worst is true. The stuff it brings to the table, you're not especially surprised about because this White House has leaked since day one. So we, we knew so much that this is just further confirmation of what we knew. But can we have some of those wild details? Oh, the name calling, for one thing. You know, everyone, I mean, the book was essentially I, I couldn't even quote the book because every other line in it has, you know, an expletive because people are just yelling at each other the whole time. So there's many, many battles. You know, Trump calls Jeff Sessions retarded. He calls Reince Priebus a little rat. In these scenes, the people that come off the worst also are Jared and Ivanka. I mean, they're just sort of dithering around the margins of the book and everyone sort of despises them. Anyway, it's things like that, small things. The fact that Donald Trump, you can't even prepare for a meeting with him. You bring in even a single sheet of paper with some facts. He doesn't want to see it and won't see it and just has these, you know, beliefs that came from somewhere that he's not going to get let loose of for anything. Did anything shock you? No, that's the thing. <laughs> I kept waiting for, I don't know, I kept waiting for more sort of nuclear warheads to drop in this book and they, and they don't. I can't even say, you know, I didn't really enjoy the process of reading it. I, it's very, I think Woodward sees this as a, as a key moment, a key book for him. He's 75. Who knows how many more of these books he'll write. And he's been chided in the past for, I think, for lingering on more of the human details and, and sprinkling stuff, setting scenes and have people ordering their pasta. And this book is not a pasta book. This book is policy, policy, policy. It's it, interesting. And madness, madness, madness. I feel like... Donald Trump in a way and sort of the way he lives out his life it's like a little bit like Michael Jackson like you just you can't understand like how they go about sort of like go through their mechanics of their day because they just seem so I don't know Woodward doesn't really tell us that the portrait is not of Trump the portrait is of Trump clashing with his advisors mm -hmm. you know the scene will be you know he's at the resolute desk in the Oval Office or he's at Bedminster the golf club but no description of Bedminster no description of the Oval Office it's just advisors coming in and then the next advisor contradicting this advisor and it's the it's the clash of the semi responsible I mean I use the word semi advisedly but you know people who are actually live on this planet versus advisors who are just off the rails and Several of those are, are the demons of this book. Peter Navarro, who's a trade guy, is demonized in this book. And Bannon, to some degree, although Bannon was clearly a source, Stephen Miller is clearly a, a villain in this book. And so you have these people trying to save Trump from his worst angels, his darkest angels, his, his devils. <laughs> <laughs> the anonymous op-ed came out on the heels of this book. Did you have any? Obviously, we none of us have any special knowledge here about that op-ed, but having read the book, do you feel like you... No, you know, I mean, this book, most of the people who talk for this book are people, obviously, who have left the office. I mean, Roy Porter, who was the who was not a chief of staff, but an assistant, and Gary Cohn, who's the economic advisor, was definitely a uh, major source. Ryan's Priebus was a major source. So these were the people he was getting these details from who were there. I don't know who would be there now who would be that person. Is it Mike Pence? I don't think so. It doesn't seem like a Pence... It seemed like a pencil like But at this me. point, would it really shock you? What, what would happen that would shock, shock you? Well, that's exactly what? And I was trying to think. What would shock yeah. us at this point? I think it would shock us if, like, Trump got into bed every night and read John Donne, you know, quietly <laughs> by <laughs> a little diet soda. By <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Which is what Michael Jackson was said to have done at some point. He was supposedly had a favorite poet who was like Yeats or something. Anyway, crazy, crazy, crazy. Anyway, Woodward's book is, is, is interesting. You know, a little disappointing just because I'm not sure in this kind of news cycle, nothing really reverberates anymore. I feel like it's going to be a one day, two day, three day story. and It's going to be gone. I mean, things just are happening so fast in the world. I just, you know, Woodward books used to resonate in the political culture for a month. And I just don't see that with this one. Well, closely related to the Woodward <laughs> book. Speaking, <laughs> speaking of Woodward. Speaking of crazy, crazy, crazy. <laughs> Parl, tell us about the book you reviewed. I reviewed a book by the Icelandic writer Schoen. The book is called Codex 1962. And as I said in the review, it feels like this book was designed to drive me crazy. It has everything I hate. It has unicorns. It has angels. It has long ruminations about the role of myth 
in in um, ancient and present day society. And altogether, I kind of loved it. For I loved parts of it. Schoen is sort of compared to Borges and Kafka. He's considered to be one of the great storytellers living today. And since I think 2013, his books have been sort of rapidly, you know, we're trying to get them all into English. And this book is called his masterpiece. It's 20 years in the making. It's this trilogy following this Jewish fugitive from the camps who's traveling with a, a little clay figure in a hat box that becomes his son and they end up in Iceland and, you know, sort of get mixed up in the underclass. But the re- like that's the, the, the sort of spine of the story. The real sort of action in the book are these little digressions and forays and this anecdote and this piece of gossip and this piece of myth. So it's, it's a very busy book, it's sort of, I compared it to Arabian Nights. It's sort of within, within this story, there are thousands of litters and litters of, of, of other little like narratives. And it's, it's, it was a really interesting experience for me because this is a genre I don't read so widely in. And like, I think that's when this job can become especially interesting when you read outside of your taste. But I felt, you know, like shown is so important important and will be important. So it was sort of like a mountain I felt like I had to climb and I, I survived more or less, you know, I mean, I think it, 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 this book sort of misses the quality that makes some of the other books so uh, arresting. His, his previous books are incredibly short, 150 pages, 140 pages, and the language is so compressed and tight and it cuts. And with that kind of discipline, I think I enjoy some of the more fantastical elements Dealing with this book, which is like upwards of 500 pages, you know, and is and is something you can really feel shown really settling into his story. <laughs> you know, like there are no checks. His, his imagination is completely unfettered. Um, so in that sense, it was a bit of a slog. But, you know, um, it is just a, yeah, it's, it is really interesting to, to read somebody. I, I, I mean, I'm sure you guys have this feeling that you just know that. I, I feel like this generation of writers is going to read him, that things are going to happen because of him and the sort of stuff that he's doing and the way that he sort of lets himself imagine. Mm-hmm. Very interesting phrase you used, a read, reading outside of your taste. Is mm-hmm. that what you said? Because yeah. I, I worry about that a lot as a critic because, you know, I definitely have pretty strong – I mean, the things I like, I like. The things I don't like, I don't like. And, you know, a lot of things I don't like, people really like. Mm-hmm. And that keeps me up at night, missing mm-hmm. something or, or, or being hard on something that – and I'm not talking about – I'm talking about something that might actually be really good. It's just yeah, not right. my thing. I mean, yeah. a lot of things I think, you know, I don't like because they're not good. But some th- you worry about missing things that are good. And you worry – I mean, I think that's exactly right. And I think I do worry about when I try to step out and force myself to stretch because you're also going into these genres that people are incredibly passionate about and possessive of, rightfully so, you know, especially when it comes to genre fiction. There are whole kinds of criticisms and vocabularies of discussion. So best case scenario, I do get time to sort of read the book and then also kind of read the criticism and, and the way that people actually know the genre well, write about it and what they think, what, how do I know if it works if I don't, if I'm not steeped mm. in it? Yeah. Well, you know? all of you having had experience as editors at the book review know that that also happens to you when we distribute the galleys around and you go through the books and our, one of our colleagues, Elida Becker, will come in with a book and say, well, this isn't my cup of tea, you know, <laughs> holding up a sort of gritty Civil War novel. Yeah. Um, but is it harder, I guess, than, you know, with, with, with it, as an editor, you can at least try to come up with a writer who you think would appreciate it. Right. As a critic, you can't kind of delegate it, hand it off to exactly. someone else. And the danger cuts both ways. You don't want to be so open-minded that, you know, well, as you said, your brain falls out, but mm-hmm. so open-minded that you're sort mm-hmm. of giving everything the benefit of the doubt because that's someone right. might that's like right. this. Then you're right. just saying nothing and then you just have to go kill yourself, you know? Well, and I think that that's when it becomes really interesting for me to think about writing for a specific reader, you know, like, like thinking about the audience and sort of really thinking about describing a book like this, shown and, ima- and imagining actually just talking about it, like were I to talk about it with you guys. You know, and that sort of acts like that clarifies my thinking because I can still get in there and say what I think. But then I can still sort of also step out of that enough to say, you know, this is what somebody who really loves this genre might feel. You know, like I think that it becomes it becomes more complicated when you are sort of sort of forgetting to trust that also part of the job is the reader knows you. They know your tastes. They know what you like. And you can also still be honest about what you may not even understand or what you're not sure and what you suspect somebody might not like, you know. It's more conversational in this way. It's a different kind of relationship that you have with the reader, I think, when you're reviewing something that's a little bit outside of your wheelhouse. Um, 
that so enjoy. Those who don't read the New York Times every day might not necessarily know that, uh, Dwight, you actually reviewed two books this week because Bob Woodward's book doesn't come out until next week and right. it, it leaked. So, Jen, you, you got an unexpected hiatus here from right. our pages. But before we talk about the book that you did write about, I actually want to talk about the other book Dwight reviewed this week, mm. John Kerry's memoir, and any unexpected links between the two books that you covered other than they're both about Washington. Uh, you know, Carrie's book is such an old school kind of book. And as I say in my review, it's so reassuringly old school. I mean, it's just... I think he said reassuringly boring. He's reassuringly boring. And so is the book. Although I don't want to be too hard on the book because he had a really interesting life. I mean, he just, you know, just did everything and just pushed himself physically as well as, as well as intellectually and politically. And it's a busy story and the is details... It's a memoir. And it's it's pretty well written. I mean, it's a little dull. The second half is, is for me, was just kind of soul killing because it was all just diplomacy, shuttle diplomacy as a congressman and as secretary of state. And, you know, I can see the worth for, for history of knowing these details and what went down. But as for a casual political reader, it was it was far too much, 300 pages of that uh, towards the end. But, um, you know, dull. It made me kind of miss him. It made me certainly respect him. He's just hes just a serious man and it makes you mourn. It made me mourn with John McCain dying and in, in reading this really intense portrait of bipartisan work in the Senate when he was there and, and the great figures of the Senate who are still there, McCain and Teddy Kennedy, primary among them, but many others as well. And as he writes in the book, you know, every time a big figure resigned from the Senate, a really small, mean figure would replace them, especially on the right. I mean, he, he contrasted Hal Heflin from Alabama, the senator, with uh, Jeff Sessions coming in. And he writes, you know, Sessions just didn't work with Democrats no matter what. You know, there's just no bargaining. And he feels that's where we are now politically. So, But also, I would imagine with McCain dying, there's that parallel between these two men who had these remarkable experiences in Vietnam, these incredible formative experiences, both of which were then later maligned. Kerry is, remains livid about the swift boating, you know, sure. of his work over there. And he, you know, this is just, I mean, first of all, he writes very well about his wartime experience. It's quite intense. Clearly, he's gone back over the accounts that were, you know, written you know, at the time. But, you know, he also marshals a, just a airtight defense of those who attacked him. And you, you just can't believe what an ugly smear it was. I mean, really ugly by people who didn't, weren't there at all, who were, who were doing it. So he's, he's bitter about that. His big mistakes, he says he wished he had stopped his campaign for president and just addressed those the way Obama stopped his campaign after the uh, Reverend Wright stuff mm -hmm. came up. Obama just stopped cold and said, we're going to talk about this. And uh, Kerry wished he had done that. He regrets picking John Edwards for obvious reasons. There are three or four prime regrets he has. One is, is authorizing the Gulf War. He he went along with Bush on that. So it's a real book. You know, it's not a it's not a it's not a uh, phoned in thing. It's dull at times, but it made me feel sort of patriotic. What a rare thing. <laughs> <laughs> Jen, what did you review? So last week I reviewed this book called The Personality Brokers, which is by a scholar named Merv Emre. She teaches English at the University of Oxford, and she wanted to write this history of the Myers Briggs personality indicator. I think I'm getting that right. I know that the word test is actually supposed to be forbidden by the organization that distributes this, essentially a test. Um, <laughs> we can say it we here, We can Jen. say it. We can say We're it. We're allowed. And uh, so she, she wrote this history of the MBTI, but really she sort of situates it within the lives of the two women who created it. And first of all, I didn't know that the MBTI was created by two women. I think sort of the assumption on the part of a lot of people, even those who are somewhat familiar with it, is that it was created by a couple of male psychologists. And in fact, these women, a mother and daughter, were not trained in psychology at all. And so they created this type indicator. At first, the idea was they just observed their family members and wanted to know what kind of personality types they had in order to encourage, you know, harmonious interactions. And then the daughter, whose name was Isabel, she really, during World War II, developed it into something more systematic. And it was based on Carl Jung's archetypes, uh, but really differed from them, ultimately. And it turned into a tool that eventually became used by corporations in order to make personnel decisions to make sure that, you know, if they promoted somebody, that they would be good at, say, a management job. And also colleges would use it to pair up roommates as well as provide guidance counseling. And then people would often use it for self-help. And so it, it has become this indicator that people know about and that 
many people have taken, but the history of it was sort of unsung. And so she wanted to look at that. And I guess ultimately what she shows is that it's not really based on any science. I mean, it's really just, I mean... Astrology? There's a way in which it is kind of like astrology in the sense that it's not scientific. But then if you talk to people who actually you know, sort of have found a lot of guidance from it, they will swear that there's something to it and that they've actually gotten a lot from it. And so she says in this book that she re- really wanted to do justice to that experience as well, even though for, from her own perspective, she's just extremely skeptical. And the book is really interesting because it actually turns out to be less, I mean, the MBTI obviously is a part of it, a huge part of it. That's sort of the center of the story. But at the same time, the book turns into something much weirder about, you know, these women's lives and just sort of how they saw the world and how sort of idiosyncratic they themselves were. Mm -hmm. And so it sort of goes to this larger picture of just how we sort of see ourselves and how we see ourselves isn't necessarily something that's stable and constant. And I really enjoyed it. I mean, it was a did really... You, uh, did you apply the test to your own life? Did you... Well, it's so funny. So to, to really take the test, you have to spend like $2,000 and oh. go to huh. a center. I think she talks about going to someplace in Manhattan, but there are centers all over the country where to officially take the test, you have to spend this money and they will you will be asked certain questions on a questionnaire, which will apparently reveal your type. I was actually just saying earlier that before the podcast started that I remember taking the test, I think, in elementary school. I'm not sure why. And I don't remember. Your parents my, didn't want to tell you. No, I, I, I think. And again, I don't think. I don't think. I don't think it was the official <laughs> test because again, I think the official test is like a days long process. But I took the test, and the only thing I remember was that I was an I, which is introvert. The other, <laughs> the other things I Repressed. don't. <laughs> well, that's not shocking. Yeah. <laughs> Another so, not shocking thing. To- right. So in any case, the thing about this book also that I wanted to emphasize is that it's really beautifully written. She's a really sort of fluid writer, and it really, there's something about it, especially when you get to know the mother-daughter team, Catherine and Isabel, you know, they sort of become like these very, very strange characters in a novel. Have you read Annie Murphy Paul's book? I took a look at it. Yeah. Yeah. And she talks about sort of the way that these social or these personality indicators. So Annie Murphy Paul wrote this book, The Cult of Personality, about 10 years ago, which I guess was kind of an expose of the Myers-Briggs. Yes. And about how, you know, companies use these personality tests in order to make big decisions that affect people and really, you know, how little these tests are actually based on. So, Carl so, Dwight, uh, did your parents test you also secretly? No, I actually had a boyfriend who made me take the test. Uh, <laughs> this is so weird. And were you compatible types? Uh, so no, it's like but diner. You so can, strange, <laughs> right? I remember the type I, I was. I don't remember. Like, it's like You can always be like one of two. You're like introvert, extrovert. Yeah, you're the, reasoning or intuitive. Uh, you're perception or judging. Intuitive or sensing. Intuitive or sensing. Yes. Um, yeah, and then like there's also like a name. I think if you take it online, they'll be like, "You are the general. You are the teacher. You oh, are really? the." I think so. If this, I th- I'm pretty sure. Okay. Like you're, you're given some kind of archetype. You are the philosopher. Yeah, I don't know. Pretty meaningless. I think. Right. I it, I said, well, this is. Yeah, it's I mean, like, why not? You know? Okay. You know. You feel, I can agree with my introverted diagnosis, yeah. but at the same time, I'm like, am I really that? I mean, I don't. <laughs> I kind of feel like it's all sort of based on these squishy. Foundations and also people change over time. That's the other thing about this book that you sort of see, especially in the lives of these women, is that they do change. Oh, yeah. And so that's the other thing. I mean, supposedly a fundamental premise of the MBTI is that types don't change. That hmm. that yeah. is yeah. something that people who actually do the accreditation process are supposed to really... So nice. I mean, it sounds a little I, cultish. I, I, what but. I do find touching is the way that people really cling to this. Oh, yeah. And, like, and it, it makes them feel so right. seen and right. understood. Well, I, think, I mean, it's like astrology in that way you feel. Yes, you know. and I think that there's a way in which when people sort of come to a point in their lives where they're sort of reflecting on the decisions they've made or trying to think about big decisions they have to make, some people really derive some real guidance from it. I mean... Well, I don't believe yeah. that any uh, real introvert <laughs> would submit to coming on to a podcast uh, twice a month. So anyway, thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank you. Stella. 
Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books. And you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. I write back. The Book Review Podcast is produced by Peter Rosado from Headstepper Media with the great help of my colleague, John Williams. Thanks for listening. For The New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul. Pamela Paul.